warm Chesterfield May Day welcome to John Burroughs from the National Union Mine Workers, former leader of Chesterfield Borough Council, who's going to speak to us today. John. James, thank you very much for that introduction. It's strange when you sit down to prepare to speak to an audience like this. You get a start and as you sit here you recognise you've missed some things. I've missed this because I've just seen it. Never forgive and never forget the people that scabbed on the miners in 1984 will still be scabs and we will still be solid. The second thing that I need to remind people of, it's nice for me and James to be the token men on this stage, to see strong women, the people that I live with, all of them here, strong women born out of the struggle that we've worked towards over the years. So then, to the official start, it's a massive, massive thank you for inviting me to speak here on this magnificent May Day rally. 40 years on, anniversary of the Great Miners' Strike. I want to make a special mention again because today has been a real honour again for me to march first and last, I only did first 50 yards at last 50 yards, but I've done first and last, behind that banner of the National Union of Mine Workers. Alan Gascoigne was the branch secretary at the Shirebrook branch, right on the border between Notts and Derbyshire, and along with his solids, he recovered, restored, and replaced that banner from a situation where it was in dire trouble to a place where they can demonstrate it, display it, and there for everybody to see in the Shirebrook miners' welfare. Well done and thank you. Um, I want to make another comment about the first time I went on a May Day march. It's 46 years ago today. 46 years ago, there were relatively few of us. It was pelted it down. And uh, the people on the sides were laughing at us. Well, they're not laughing today, are they? Uh, the numbers of people that are here again swell in the ranks. Um, we also need to recognise that these things don't organise themselves. There is a tremendous amount, months and months of work goes into getting these things organised. The characters from the days of the first days of change, James Eden, is a relatively new person, but he does a first class job of keeping this uh, activity organised. Well done, James. But I want to make one special mention because easily forgotten is the guy that does, the man with a plan that works. Colin Hampton has been around in our town. I've got to tell you, he comes from Elston, so he's not, uh, he's not exactly a, a regular here, but he's been around for a long time. And this sort of thing is organised by Colin. Well done. Thank you. It's important that we remember and commemorate the 40th anniversary of the Great Miners' Strike. It was a year of desperate but magnificent struggle for miners and their families. Facing a state machine headed by Thatcher, hell-bent on smashing the NUM. In the knowledge that if she smashed the NUM, she smashed the trade union movement. Sadly, the TUC of the time and some major trade unions and some Labour politicians disgracefully turned their backs on the miners at that time. And, and turned their backs on the miners' family at that time. But then again, not a shame, was the fact that local branches, regional branches of the trade unions, some national organisations of the trade unions, some Labour politicians that were not in the limelight, supported, helped finance the strike in some ways that I'm personally still not at liberty to tell you. Um, that support that we received when it was magnificent. And apart from the miners' leaders here in Chesterfield and the wider Derbyshire coalfield, as a leader in Derbyshire, I was dispatched by the Triorchy of Magaki, Heathfield and Scargill to go and do some fundraising in some strange places. Japan, that was interesting. 
Germany, East, that was even more interesting. And Southern Ireland, and yes, a bomb did explode. And yes, the people that were looking after us got around us and made sure that we we're okay. So that was the way that we were operating at that time, a tremendous amount of money brought back into the miners' strike funds. Mentioned particularly, and I've seen one or two of them, they're not young anymore, but those magnificent young miners of the time, who were a magnificent credit to their own trade union and trade unionism in general. They faced poverty and prison, coppers and truncheons, dogs and mounted police, hunger and ridicule. I was, and still am, proud to be one of them in a leadership role at the time, doing 18 hours a day at the time and a few nights as well. I've still never crossed a picket line. And what's more, I never will. And what's even more, neither should you. I remember well the day in, day out, week in, week out, yes, month in, month out struggle. The early days of hope and expectation, the national leadership of Scargill, Heathfield and Magaki, tirelessly travelling around the coal field, and ensuring that support was there and in numbers. Um, I was busy also financing those unfortunate young men and women that were arrested on trumped up charges and dealing with the finances that they encountered as a consequence of. I was then also involved in court action against me, a high court action, that place that you see on telly when they take the murderers in and places like that. Personally charged with misuse of union funds. Misuse of union funds, yes. I was simply carrying out the role that I was elected to do and funding pickets and their wives in their day-to-day -day activities and putting money into their pockets and their families packets. I was found guilty. Just one of many times I was found guilty. I've never been so proud of being guilty in my life. And I wear that guilty badge with a lot of pride and share it with good many of our coal miners and their families. The Battle of Orgreave, John Dunn mentioned it earlier on. The Battle of Orgreave is an example of how the state treated our miners. Still today, ex-miners are being robbed of justice for their part in that battle. Coppers out of control, battens and horses, false charges, which saw men losing their livelihood while fighting for nothing more than the right to work. Never has there been a bigger case for a public inquiry than that particular activity. And I call upon all of you here today and everywhere that you'll get to, to support the Orgreave Truth and Justice campaign in every way that you can. And then, just as importantly, the magnificent wives, mothers, sisters, girlfriends, who formed the women's action groups. Most of them had had no previous knowledge or experience of industrial action, politicised on the fire of a national year-long strike. They rose to the challenges never before seen and never since seen, in my opinion. Not just providing the traditional role of a soup kitchen and making a sandwich, but out there on the picket lines doing the same thing that their men were doing. They were described by the stalwart John Dunn. Is John here? Described by the stalwart John Dunn as the real iron ladies. It could not have been a better description than that one. I'm proud of all my daughters. I'm particularly proud of Cheryl. I'm mentioning her today because if I begin to croak, I've told her she's coming up here to take over from me. Um, and uh, I know she'll make a job of it. Then Kate Alvey was one of the real iron ladies here in North Derbyshire. She recently told us of the range of people who supported and contributed to that strike. While they were fundraising with the Women's Action Group, Muslim and Jew, Sikh and Christian, black, brown and white, straight and gay, young and old, 
fit and disabled from every part of life people stood up to be counted at that time no distinction or division like the Tories currently are trying to create in our country <laughs> supporting the working class in their struggle the attitude of the police for me was best summed up when I was on a women's picket line and the superintendent who obviously knew who I was I don't know how um, he came over to me and said pointing to the women's pickets you don't actually breed off them cows do you and I said to him as quickly as I could yeah we do but we don't breed pigs like your mother did <laughs> and uh, that guy followed me all over the place I expect he wanted to nick me. So I took him in the colliery stockyard, which I knew like the back of my hand. Came out on my own, I don't think he's ever been found. <laughs> I'm told that he is haunting that place uh, as it is now. And then the shame of the Knotts Miners Scab Union. That will go down in workers' history in the same way that Spencer went down in 26 just as will the strength of those solid miners in Nottinghamshire, in Leicestershire, in South Derbyshire, and other areas where they were solid. The Dirty 30, for example, stuck on those guys as a bad label. They adopted it and embraced it, and what a job they did. Um, and of course, Thatcher repaid those scabs, didn't she? She shut the pits down in Nottinghamshire just as quickly as she shut the pits in every other place. The 1984 miners' strike saw a real setback for the trade union movement. Those trade union leaders that turned the back on us, refused to stand up and be counted, were suddenly cowed and subdued. I confess to feeling a bit of sadness, cowed, subdued, not me, but after 40 years the wages and conditions were deteriorating, industry pushed back, and wages falling behind inflation, conditions of employment reversed, layoffs, minimum wage conditions, zero hour contracts, unions practically neutered. I should have known though, you can't keep workers down for very long. Workers rebelled, best perhaps exemplified recently by the likes of the magnificent Mick Lynch. But teachers, posters, nurses, doctors, even medical consultants and barristers, so many others taking strike action for better wages and conditions and at the same time maintaining public support. As the saying goes, those who forget the lessons of history are doomed to repeat it. We must continue to support our junior doctors who are still striking for better wages and conditions. Let's not forget that Haslev have started a seven-day overtime ban from today and they need support. Here in Chesterfield, the Trades Council and the Labour movement have always been at the forefront of workers' struggle by supporting, demonstrating and raising attention to that struggle. All of our efforts in the best traditions of the Labour movement. This government, after 14 years of Tory mismanagement, example by the likes of Liz Truss and Boris Johnson. <laughs> Boris Johnson, there's a laugh. <laughs> People are just beginning to recognise he tells lies. I knew he was telling lies from the first time I saw him. As soon as his lips started moving, he was lying. The guy can't lay straight in bed. The Tories have driven people most in need into the ground. Cuts to services vital to our people like social care, the NHS, public transport and many more are all dramatically underfunded. Tell me if I'm going on too long, James. The disgraceful annual increment, increase in the retirement age, especially for WASPy women. What a disgrace that was, is. Utilities, gas, electricity, water, public transport, simply doing what they want to do to make a profit from your pockets. Local councils in an unprecedented decline of underfunding, some the equivalent of bankrupt. None are as bankrupt as this despair of a government 
that we've got today. And now they're telling us it's getting better. It can't be any worse than the last 14 years of Tory control. Still today, the right wing in our politics revel in creating division among us. None more so than the Tory right wing. And let's slip Farage in there. You know, Nigel with the cigarette and the pint. The equivalent of Oswald Mosley in today's terms. <laughs> Waiting for his chance to return to some sort of a platform. All of these people are playing up to the genetic differences with no other motivation than creating division. And they're aided and abetted by the Tory barons in the press and the Tory journalists that report. I've been a Labour Party member now for close to 60 years. You can boo me if you like, but I'll be one on my coffin. And I've got some interesting information for Keir, what's his name? Keir? <laughs> Starmer, that's him, Keir Starmer. Workers best get the results when they are led and represented by leaders who are brave, progressive and socialist. Nothing is gained by just changing the management of the same economy. Starmer, you must offer those you are supposed to represent some real change. Get money into the vital services we rely on. Boost the economy by raising the standard of living of working people and, yes, pensioners. Pay the waspy women the compensation they demand. Take back the vital industries into public ownership. Stop the profiteering of energy companies mostly owned by foreign companies pretending to care for those most in need. Reverse the underfunding of the rail network and renationalise it. Stop the water companies from literally pumping shit into our rivers and water courses. There is one other thing Keir Starmer should announce, and he should do it straight away. Resignation. It would win him votes and boost the economy at one fell swoop. This disgraceful government is still kicking the miners. A total of £1.5 billion is sitting in the investment reserve of the mine workers' pension fund. Starmer should immediately announce that it will be released and paid to increase miners' pensions across the piece. And everyone here can make two positive moves to help with that. Write to your MP. All you've got to do is put the name, House of Commons, and send it. You don't have to put a stamp on, somebody will pay for it. <laughs> Write to your MP or even those that want to be your MP and ask them a simple question. Do you support the funds held up in the mine workers' pension scheme being released and paid out to the pensioners and their widows? And the second, if you're in receipt of a pit pension, is to vote for Alan Gascoigne, who's carried that banner around today. Alan Gascoigne is the lone voice on the mine workers' pension scheme, arguing for that money to be released, and he deserves your support. Terry Colgan. Not in 21st century the world, this country should be ashamed that there are hospital waiting lists that literally leave people dying for the lack of kept treatment. Children in poverty, food banks, the mainstay support of underprivileged masses. Homelessness, a benefit system that is part of our welfare state where being disabled or unable to work is a stigma. An NHS so deliberately underfunded was to drive it into private hands, the private hands of the Tory grandees' friends. My call here today is wake up Britain. It's time for real change. Build on the recent local council elections and get success into government. And along with our trade union sisters and brothers, we can achieve a standard of living that working people deserve. I'm at the back end of my time on this earth but I'm still at the front end of the struggle and the battle for workers' rights. I'm proud of it. And my final question to you, will you join me in that struggle? Thank you.
Thank you so much, John.